evolutionists will consistently claim that mutations are the reason for the variety of life on the planet, but they seem to forget that mutations are almost always harmful. They present pictures of mutated fruit flies in the textbooks, but never seem to mention that the mutations they present are all harmful. There is no way that an extremely rare beneficial mutation can even come close to offsetting the deleterious effects of harmful mutation. Looks like this one is just about wrapped up, but first, I had to investigate. When Charles Darwin co-opted the term survival of the fittest from economist Herbert Spencer, he defined fitness as better designed for an immediate local environment. At the time, he had speculated that the mechanism for inheritance in a cell would have to be very complex and, most likely, located in the nucleus. Calling this mechanism a gemule, he did not live to see the discovery of DNA. In episode 18, I discussed the discovery of DNA and the subsequent experiments in mutating genes. In 1900, three scientists, Carl Korins, Eric von Schermach, and Hugo de Vries, independently rediscovered the work of Gregor Mendel. De Vries proposed that new species were created by mutation, and therefore there was no need for either Lamarckism or Darwinism. Thomas Henry Morgan had also dismissed both evolutionary theories and attempted to prove de Vries' mutation theory with his experimental heredity work. Around 1908, Morgan and his students began conducting experiments with the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster, mutating them through physical, chemical, and radiational means. In 1910, Morgan noticed a white-eyed mutant male among the red-eyed wild types. When white flies were bred with a red-eyed female, their progeny were all red-eyed. A second generation cross-produced white-eyed males as well as a pink-eyed mutant that showed a different pattern of inheritance. Inadvertently, Morgan had performed Gregor Mendel's experiments but with fruit flies instead of pea plants. In 1911, he published a paper in Science and concluded that some traits were linked to sex and predicted that other genes would be carried on specific chromosomes, essentially showing definitive proof that natural selection was the mechanism mechanism for the proliferation of mutations. In 1915, Mildred A. Hogue recovered a set of mutants in her experiments whose eyes had not developed and found that they mapped genetically to the same chromosome. Publishing in the American Naturalist, she announced that she had discovered the eyeless gene. Building off of Hogue's work, future experiments have gone on to isolate and mutate genes for eyes, producing different colored eyes as well as eyes in different locations on the bodies of fruit flies. Experiments since then have also isolated and modified genes for other specific body parts in Drosophila, including wings. For example, this fly with extra wings. Starting in 1919, Herman Joseph Muller began conducting experiments using radiation to modify genes in several types of organisms, including wasps and corn. After he delivered a paper entitled The Problem of Genetic Modification at the Fifth International Congress of Genetics in Berlin, his work was repeated and continues to be repeated by several others. Pictures of these experiments commonly appear in school textbooks as examples of mutations. They are not meant to be examples of beneficial mutations. The point of these experiments was to determine what genes catalyze which features in their subjects. Compiling all of this work, we can statistically see that in fact, most mutations are neutral. On September 1, 2000, Michael Nachman and Susan Kroll published a paper in the journal Genetics summarizing their comparisons of the mutation rates of humans and chimpanzees. On average, each of us is born with 175 new mutations not shared by our parents. Of those, only three would be deleterious and one would be immediately beneficial. With deleterious mutations outnumbering beneficial mutations three to one, one might assume that the deleterious mutations would overtake the beneficial ones. This is where natural selection comes into play. Immediately harmful mutations tend to reduce the individual's chances of reproduction, so they are not passed on as often. Mutations which lead to a greater chance of reproduction will always be favored via continued survival or merely due to their appeal to mates. The more deleterious the mutation is, the less likely it is to be passed on. The more beneficial a mutation is, the more likely it is to be passed on. I will cover this in much greater detail in future episodes. In the last episode, I showed how a duplication mutation and subsequent frame shift mutation gave a species of flavobacteria the ability to ingest nylon, which has only existed since it was invented in 1925. This gave the species an advantage by having one more food source available to it. 
but this is hardly the only example of a beneficial mutation. In July of 2001, Susanna Remold and Richard Lenski from the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at the University of Michigan Medical School published a paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science which covered their work observing mutations in a culture of E. coli bacteria in a changing environment. Out of 26 observed mutations, three of them were beneficial, allowing the culture to survive more efficiently in maltose. In 1983, Martin A. Boras isolated two cultures of chlorella pyrenoidosa, a blue-green algae which he kept as a food stock for his experiments with Brachionis. By accident, Boras released an overwhelming amount of Brachionis into one culture of chlorella. In this high predatory environment, the chlorella tended to clump together into colonies, making them too large for the Brachionis to ingest. Eventually, members of some colonies began specializing in certain duties, allowing other members to specialize in more duties. Specialization of tissues is the definitive step from unicellular colony to multicellular individual. This species is now referred to as chlorella vulgaris. Even gene deletions can serve as a beneficial mutation. For example, in 1979, Barry Hall conducted a series of experiments in which he deleted an important gene in an E. coli bacterium which allowed them to use sugar as a food source. He published his results in the Journal of Bacteriology. In humans, at least two mutations have been shown to create immunity to AIDS. In 1996, a team led by Michael Dean from the Laboratory of Genomic Diversity at the National Cancer Institute published a paper in the journal Science detailing their study of the genomes of Europeans with this immunity and traced it to the deletion of the CKR5 gene. Without this gene, their bodies did not create the CKR5 chemokine receptor, which is what allows the HIV virus to infect the cell. In 2001, Susanna Remold and Richard Lenski again traced the source of immunity in many Europeans to a mutation in the CCR5 Delta 32 gene. People with two copies of this gene also manifest immunity to HIV and AIDS. In May of 2002, a team led by Lynn Boyden in attempting to find a cure for osteoporosis examined the LRP5 genes in 20 members of a family in Connecticut. The LRP5 gene was known to be the source of osteoporosis, but in this family was a modified version called LRP5V171, which produced extremely dense, nearly unbreakable bones. Beneficial mutations are all around us. They are not rare, and through natural selection, they continue to compound, producing individuals who are more and more fit for their immediate environment. In this episode, I barely scratched the surface on the number of documented cases of beneficial mutations. And that's just another example of how creationism taught me real science. If there's a creationist argument you think I should investigate, please comment below. It may become the basis for a future episode. In the meantime, subscribe and make sure you don't miss it.